Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 5th, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I swear I mean it, especially since I've got to redo last week's show, plus there's a lot of things to talk about this week. So anyway, that'll make sense in just one minute. There's a display screen. Let me just sum it up for you really quick. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right. All right, what we talk about? Well, I want to go back and redo some of the things we did from last week. So we're going to go back to the charts, and that's what I wanted to do last week because I, re I received a lot of questions on uh, setups and why. And it's funny. Those who are new to the service are like, oh, Dave, I get it. You just trade bow ties. And I'm like, no, no, we – we saw a lot of bow ties, so we decided to take those opportunities, which I'll flesh out in just one second. But we trade a lot of different patterns. Uh, they're mostly pullback related, but the emerging trend patterns are a little bit different than the actual uh, pullbacks themselves. So let's take a look. Uh, we'll take a look at that in just one second. So I'm going to go back and redid, redo what we did last week. It shouldn't take too long, though. Now that I've, I've got the one rehearsal down. Uh, what happened was uh, some, somehow the video seeking didn't work, and then when it uploaded to YouTube, it, it um, the uh, video and the audio became unsynced, and, and I'm not sure how to um, fix that. Oh, I forgot to uh, crack open the Mountain Dew. <laughs> I'm so anxious to jump in the charts. Makers of Mountain Dew did not compensate me for each free endorsement, and Red Bull said I was too fat. Anyway, we talk about. Uh, I also want to talk about deteriorating conditions. And uh, last week, I, I guess I teased you, but I didn't actually give you the link, or I don't know if it went through the um, went through due to the video problems. But um, if you want the link to the uh, seven dollar getting started service, I'll have that at the end of this, uh, or actually throughout this presentation. So just stay tuned for a little while, because I know everybody can't stay the whole time. Uh, the other big thing that we're talking about this week is the deterioration conditions, and there are some areas that are still bullish. Okay. And those areas are being tested, too. At least some of those areas are being tested. And we're going to get into all that in a lot of detail. All right. So last week, we were talking about the model portfolio. And this is a snapshot from last week. Let me just rush through it quickly here uh, because I know you guys who are on the service or who have been around for a while, are, are, your eyes are glazing over. But this is based on a hypothetical. Just bear with me one second. This is based on a hypothetical 100K account. 2% per position, and it's $2,000. And that's if, if, if stopped out. The initial profit target, which is, do I have it in here? Oh, my, um, let me see if I can fix the snapshot. For some reason, the snapshot is um, too big. Let me see if we can fix this real quick. Talk about yourselves. All right, let's see if this works better, even if it's not perfect. Yeah, but it's missing some of the um, it's missing some of the important information that I wanted to show. All right, let's try it again. All right, so now it's a little bit better. So again, if you have, uh, it's based on a hypothetical. 100k account. Now, real trades might actually be um, be executed, but just for these tracking purposes in the open portfolio, we're going to assume we always have 100k. Now, obviously, if you add this number in, you could have more than 100k, but when we go to take the next position, just because I want to keep the math easy, it's always based on that you have 100k in your account. 2% per trade, equals $2,000, and that's if stopped out. Does it mean that you go out and buy $2,000 worth of this stock or this stock or whatever? You want to buy $2,000 worth if stopped out. So how do you figure that out? You take the, the risk. In this case, I calculated the risk to be three points. This stock right here, a lot more volatile, much bigger risk, okay? Uh, Percentage-wise, this stock way down here, Percentage-wise, it's a much bigger percentage-wise, but point-wise, it's very small, okay? So you do the math, and you calculate the shares accordingly. 
And you can see based on $3, you do roughly 300 shares for your trending loaf and 300 shares for your trading loaf. But you would do it at the same time. So let's just round numbers. Say we do 600 shares, divide that into two. This is going to be hopefully for a swing trade, and this is going to be hopefully for a trend trade. But you do buy them all at one time, okay? When you hit the initial profit target, which for some reason keeps getting cut off in this screen, and you can't see it. Let's see if we could, well, you can't see it. Oh, well, we'll be able to fix that. But when you hit the initial profit target, which is just simply the price plus the risk. So you can't see it on your screen, but the initial profit target on this one would be 28. And notice that 28.10 was the exit price because it probably had a little bit of a gap in there. So instead of making $1,000, which is your initial goal, you want to make 1% on the first half of the trade, you end up making a little bit more. Notice this one somewhere in here. There it is right there. Notice in this particular case, you made quite a bit more. You made about 30% more on your first loaf. And that was because it gapped open. It gapped through the profit target, which would be 645 plus the entry. And then it gapped open around 4470. Now, I use either a real trade, provided there's not just one trade. If there's just one trade at that level, and then the stock implodes from there, then I won't use it. But if I see multiple trades at that level, and uh, realistically, you could have gotten trades off. And if I have actual trades I could use at that number, then I know it could have happened. Okay, so I'll put that in here. So I try to keep this, I'm making air quotes, hypothetical portfolio as true to real conditions as possible. So that's the first half. Now, the second half, we want to make some ridiculous amount, okay? We hope this position will go forever. And we want this number to be 10 times, 100 times bigger than this number. As I said quite often, it's never enough. You want to make as much money as possible on the second loaf. This first loaf... It's good for keeping you in the game. It's good to give you a little short-term reward because we do have to take care of our psychological needs. And this is where freshman psychology is going to rear its ugly head, but it's that Maslow thing, right? We do have certain needs along that Maslow. Or what's his name? Was his name Maslow? I think it's Maslow. Hierarchy of needs. And we also have some other psychological needs. I'm not sure exactly where they fit that, but... In this microwave society where everything, we expect everything immediately, we do want some instant gratification. So this sort of fills that need. It also solves quite a few other needs. And when people say, Dave, is your money management statistical or psychological? My answer is yes. Because in, in addition to filling that psychological need, if this position comes right back in and stops out, at least you made a little bit of money. It's better than the poke in the eye. You got the short term right. You made a little money. You get stopped out for a scratch, maybe a little bit more if you're lucky. And then you move on. That's what I call the better than a poke in the eye trade. And if you keep doing that and avoid enough losers, you're going to stay in the game long enough to catch a few winners. And as I occasionally will teach about and preach about it's those black swans that we're looking for we're actually black swan hunting and that's where the real money is and that's where you're going to get paid longer term and that's the real real reward in this game okay but you have a stop in place obviously just in case and you don't always make this profit target this one actually stopped out this morning okay what do i do well i just say next okay uh, let's see, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven open positions. Now, this is a kind of a, I'm not going to say an extreme about, but very rarely do you have this many open positions. A lot of times, sometimes you have none, okay? Sometimes you only have a few. But this is a pretty big amount of open positions. But usually, when you have a lot of open positions, what happens? You built those over a period of time, and you end up with a pretty decent profit. 
And also, everywhere you see the first loaf being white, it means you've already taken partial profits on those. So you freed up, in this particular case, let me count them. You freed up one, two, three, four, five, and six. So six out of 11 positions have hit the profit target. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. Because you did half positions, you would say six divided by two. So you've got three open slots in the portfolio. So, yeah, you've got 11 open trades, but really you got three open slots. 11 minus three is what, eight? So it's like equivalent of eight open positions. And hopefully that made some sense. We'll, uh, we'll come back to that at some point. Okay, Greg, we'll get to that. Good question. So just to recap, this first loaf, in this case, we didn't quite get that 1%. That's what happens when it, when it tags a profit target and it comes right back in. So let's keep it real in here. Even though, hypothetically, it should be at least 1000 bucks. Well, in reality, no. It, it hit the profit target, came back in. Maybe some lucky guy got a trade off at 1000 but not enough people to claim that you, it could have been, you could have gotten that trade off, okay? So I try to be as conservative as possible so nobody could ever come behind me and say, Oh, this is BS. You know, there's no way that could have happened. Um, I, 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 I wish I could tell the story. Let's just say that I was with someone not that long ago. <laughs> and one of their, uh, one of their people that was under them, uh, made some recommendations and was boasting about them. And there was no way in the world that you could have actually gotten a trade off. And, and he was so bad. He was, he threatened to go kill him. <laughs> I wish I could tell this story, but yeah, you know, I shouldn't tease you like that, but, but that's how serious it is. And that's how serious people in this business who are, who are, what word do I want to use? Legit and honest. Okay. Th that's how passionate they are when it comes to someone who's doing something that's, that's, that's bullshit. Okay. So I try to keep this as real as possible, and this it, it all boils down to the repeatability thing that I'm all all to talk about. You should be able to follow me. If I say to do something, you should be able to follow me. If you're following my methodology and you fully understand the methodology and you've been through the courses and you follow along with me for a while and you've done your homework and do your homework, then you should be able to follow the methodology. Good, bad, and different, but there should be some repeatability to it. You should be able to find positions like this, or if I recommend them, you should be able to trade these positions. Provided, of course, you've got the right psychological makeup, which we can work on. Um, anyway, so that's the open portfolio. I know I've kind of beat the dead horse on this, but I, no matter how many times I talk about it, I still get more and more questions. Okay, uh, Greg says, can you explain where you move your stop when you take the profit on the first half of the trade? Yeah, uh, the stop should all I – I've been getting a few questions on this. The stop should always go up to break even, okay? Now, if I didn't properly reflect that in the spreadsheet, oops, then then my apologies. It's been an oversight. And, and just to, uh, once I get a lot of position in the spreadsheet, i got to be really careful to make sure I pay attention to everything that's going on. Uh, let's say your stop is, um, is X, okay? And let's say whatever that amount is. You get into the position and it rallies up X, okay? And you take profits on that one for one basis. But Dave, that has a negative expectancy. No, it doesn't. I have two YouTube videos where we spent nearly two hours talking about how it does not have a negative expectancy because the second loaf has an unlimited potential, and that's where the real money is. So you take profits. So let's say X equals five, and you got to fight your stop is five points away, and then you got a five point profit. Then that stop would go up on a one for one basis, five points. In other words, you want to bring that to break even. Okay. Now, if this position moved in your favor, this stop might have already been bumped up a little bit in the process. Now, let me show you one other thing because it came up, came up yesterday. Let's say your stop is down here somewhere, and the market takes off. It hits the initial profit target, but by the end of the day, 
it's back here some, somewhere. What do you do? Well, you still move that stop up to break even following the system. Okay. Now, not to digress too far, but those of you in the service have noticed in more recent time, times, I've been a little bit lenient on the first loaf. I've been kind of bumping those stops a little bit more slowly. And there's, there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, one reason is just because of the a bit of an aberration. Let's say you're in this uh, lower price issue that's uh, 2 $3 a share, and it goes up like, uh, I don't know, $0.05, cents, okay? Well, I'm not going to bother bumping that stop up $0.05, cents, but th if it does $0.05 cents and $0.06 cents over a few days before you know it, this is a significant move at a lower price issue. So um, I've kind of played the keep to change game like I talk about sometimes. If something only goes up a few cents or or at a higher price stock, 30, 40 cents, but a low price stock, just a few cents. But if you keep playing that keep the change game, sometimes those numbers begin to add up to a point where you want to tighten that stop up a little. Keep the change game just means that your stop is here. Oops, let me just restart all this. Your stop is at a certain level. Let's try one more time. Oops. Okay, you got a stock that's moving along like this, and you got a stop. Let's say you got a stop here. Well, if it moves up just a little bit, you just leave your stop where it is. And if it's just moving up just a little tiny bit, you leave that stop where it is, and then your stop opens up by that much. Okay. But on those lower price issues, if you keep doing that, it could uh, it could make a big it could make a big difference pretty quick. So that's how some of those stops got widened up, widened out on the first loaf. And in other cases, um, I just trailed them a little bit more loosely just to try to give them a little breathing rub for them to get started. Um, speaking of breathing rub, once or breathing, once I get to – once a position reaches this initial profit target, then I feel – I can kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, and, and, again, I need to come up with a ba better way of talking about it. Maybe I should talk to a few of you guys to help me out. But I call it playing with the market's money. <laughs> I know it's your money, but – it, mentally, if you kind of see this playing with the market's money, it makes it easier to allow for some of this money to be given up on that second loaf to hopefully ride out a longer-term trend. And, again, you breathe a sigh of relief once you get that initial profit target because the worst you could do, barring overnight gaps, is break even on that second loaf. And then you have the potential for unlimited gains. But you have to be willing to give up some of that second loaf or some of that second position, second loaf of the position, second uh, shares. I always call it a second loaf. In order to hopefully ride out a longer-term gain. Now, Greg, did that make sense? Before I move on to the um, charts. So let's take a look at the charts. This is what I really wanted to... Um, show you this week. Oh, last week I forgot to give you the promo code and I'll give it to you again at the end of the show. I know some of you guys can only be in here for 20 or 30 minutes and you have to go back to saving lives and building buildings and repairing automatic transmissions and doing other great things. So if you do want to get started with the service, you'll have full access, which normally is $197 a month. So if you go to the service page, davelander.com slash trading service, or if you go to um, products on my website, and then click daily trading service down towards the bottom. If you, you, there's a little click here. And once you click here, if you enter 40 off and it's all lowercase, it'll take uh, the normal introductory rate is 47 and then it'll take 40 off of that. So it'll seven bucks and you're up and running. And the new system that I have implemented, you'll have inst instant access. So if you did it right now, you'd have, you could go in and look at the, the video for coming in today and you'll actually get today's setups. It's actually just one. All right, so what was I thinking with these trades? So I know I went through this last week, so we'll go through it a little quicker this week. But you can see this one's in a longer-term downtrend. You certainly don't want to bottom fish on the way down because, you know, when it hit 2 bucks a share and it's dropping like a stone, this thing could easily go to zero, right? And, in fact, it went all the way down to probably, what was this, about 150 or something? It sure looked like it was going to zero. You're much better off waiting for some sort of signal that it has bottomed. In this particular case... It made a low, made another low, made another low, made another low, made a saucer type of pattern. Go in and read Edwards and McGee. It also made a, uh, I guess you'd call it a cup and handle or a saucer in handle. 
pattern. And then notice your bow ties spread out in here, your bow tie moving averages, okay? Uh, to those of you, and I, it's like I've got to change hats quite often here lately because we've got a lot of new guys coming in. So the new guys, if you're not familiar with bow ties, it's just a moving average crossover pattern we're looking for at the extremes. When the market is down at major, major lows, uh, several year lows, or ideally all-time lows or all-time highs, that's the best time to trade these bow ties. So you get a major low like you have here. And notice this is right about the same level. And then you get a bow tie, and then you look to trade that. Or it's also a first thrust. But if you want to know more about bow ties, I've got a couple of YouTubes out there. Um, so just check my YouTube channel, and I'll give you that link. Well, it's just a YouTube C slash Dave Landry. Or just check my website for that. Okay? So that's what I was thinking there. This is a... Uh, this had a couple things working for it. Steel and iron, I noticed, was going up, looking like that. Metals and mining were bottoming out and going up, looking like that. And then guess what? South America was going up, looking like that. So this is a South American steel and iron company. So that sounds like a good deal to me. Um, Rubicon. Now, I have what I call a Phoenix strategy. And I haven't officially published anything on this yet, although I've done quite a bit of writing, and I've been talking about it quite a bit. And all I'm doing is I'm looking for something to just fall from grace and then just kind of base out for a while and then begin to take off and set up with some sort of pattern. Well, one thing I notice is uh, the toddler phoenix or the phoenix with toddlers. And a toddler, for lack of a better word, is a, is an IPO that, that's it's still a relatively new issue, but it's only been out for a couple of years. It's, it's not, you can't say it's, it's an IPO, but it's only been out, let's say, less than a, around a year or even even two years, okay? So the stock is still relatively new. There's still some potential excitement with it. And if you watched the free webinar I did, I think last week on IPOs, I talked quite a bit about it. But just to kind of give you a little thumbnail on that, what happens is they might bring it public at the wrong time. They might not fully have their act together, and then the stock just kind of implodes. And then they get their act together, or in this case, Maybe people begin to understand the company or whatever. But then you can see it began to take off nicely. Now, that's a nice persistent move higher, and then it begins to pull back. So it's kind of a persistent pullback. It's also kind of a big picture cup and handle pattern. William O'Neill cup and handle. Cups go all the way back to Schaubacher and um, Edwards and McGee days, those, those much older classical books with technical analysis. Read them all. Okay, read the more modern classics such as Pring. But it's a pretty cool pattern. And as you can see, again, nice persistent move higher. So they kind of got their act together. And again, you don't want to bottom fish because you'll get into a lot of trouble because you don't know if this is going to zero. Okay, you're welcome, Greg. Now, this is TGA. This is Energy Company. Not doing so good today, but uh, back a couple of weeks ago, we had a nice bottoming pattern here. Kind of cup and handle-ish for those keeping score. We also had a bow tie. And then it makes a lower low and a lower high. So that's your setup right there on that particular day. Now keep in mind, when you're trading a emerging trend pattern, I call them, I have a, a, a first thrust pattern. I actually call one of them a pioneer first thrust. But as a general statement, when you're trading any emerging trend pattern, meaning it's coming off of major, major lows, or major, major highs, and that trend is trading. I used to call them trend transitional patterns. Uh, either way, those two terms are, are interchangeable. Keep in mind that that longer-term trend might, you still might be fighting that longer-term trend. It just looks to us like the tide may have appeared to turn. Like I said um, yesterday in my column, one of my clients I was talking to the day before said that I have an uncanny ability to see these new trends emerging and and I didn't I didn't really think I did and and it's like well maybe I do but all I'm doing is looking at these bow ties and I'm putting my ego aside when it comes to these things you can't say well it's been in a downtrend forever it's going to go down forever or if you're short the market you got to wake up and say well wait a minute maybe the tide has turned here and I'm going to elaborate on that in just a few minutes so that's what's going on with that setup this was an IPO that set up uh, way back last September or, or October, 
And notice that it was kind of working its way higher. Then it began to accelerate higher. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. And then a little bit of a pullback. Now, normally I like a little bit deeper pullback, but in this particular case, it is an IPO. And sometimes you only have that first shallow I, uh, pullback at IPOs. And um, it's, it's a chance. I'm getting a little farther ahead of myself, but it's like when you see this chance, you have to take it even though it doesn't pull back that much. A little bit riskier than if it pulled back more deeply, but it's worth a shot. It's accelerating higher. It's pulled back. So that's what caught my eye on that. And it's an IPO. So if you have the IPO course, go ahead and watch it where I talked about the shallow, the first little shallow pullback, the first little corrections, because sometimes they don't correct much before they take off. Now, if this was a more established issue, I'm going to be a little bit more picky and want a little bit deeper pullback. Now, this one pulled back a slight bit uh, deeper, so it looked uh, quite a bit better, but very obvious pattern here, kind of working its way higher, and then it kind of accelerated higher, and then we had a really nice correction in here, okay? So that looks a little bit better, looks a little deeper. That's almost a perfect pattern, and I'll have, I'll have to go back and, and, and watch what I uh, recorded back then in the service archives to see, but on one of these, I was thinking, I, I know I said some things I probably shouldn't have, but I it, but it just was so excited at the time of like, I can't believe that this position will not work. It looks so darn good. And, and there were a few re recently, I'm trying to think which ones they were, where I said, these things look so fantastic, they just have to work. And, and then I realized, oh, I shouldn't have said that because somebody's going to think that either one, I'm egotistical, or two, well, if Dave thinks it's going to work, it's definitely going to work. So keep in mind that on every trade, you could be wrong. But when I see something like this, it's just a thing of beauty. Speaking of a thing of beauty, okay, this is a toddler, relatively new issue. It's also kind of the Phoenix idea. It tops out, and then what happens? It just implodes and implodes and implodes. But then it begins to bottom out nicely. And you got a nice little first thrust off of lows. I'm assuming it's a bow tie. And you got a nice little handle in here, nice little pullback. So that's a good-looking little pattern. You got a little bit of overhead supply here. But not enough to worry about, and it still is it still is a relatively new issue, or a toddler as I call them. So I think that makes for a decent trade. And then GFA, you can see this is a uh, foreign company. It's a foreign construction company. It's in um, Brazil. Not so great of a stock. Okay, draw you a big blue arrow, or a big red arrow in this case. Looks pretty abysmal. But if you zoom in here, it looks pretty darn good. You got a bow tie forming. You got a first thrust. Look at this nice persistent run from lows. And you kind of got a little bit of a cup and handle looking pattern. Now, this doesn't look like much. But if you zoom in on that, it looks a lot better. And Now, everyone that I'm showing you was in that prior portfolio. And then we'll look at the current portfolio, which has, still has most of them in it. And we'll see what, they, what they've done since. So this is UAL. UAL, my, my uh, airline trading system is wait till they go up, then short them. <laughs> I hate the airlines. I don't hate them when, when I'm traveling. I just hate them as, a, as a, an investment because – and I actually feel sorry for them. It's like what a difficult business to be in. You got fuel costs, you got unions, you got gates. I mean, I don't know a lot about the business, but I know it's a business I don't want to be in. But anyway, you make all-time highs here. I'm guessing it's all-time highs, multi-year highs at least. And then you begin to base. And you can see you've got a big fat base in here. So if this thing begins to crack in earnest, it's going to have a hard time coming back up here. Why? Well, as I preach, everything I do – has some sort of psychological basis to it. I'm not trading because the moon and Mercury are in retrograde or because some arcane number counting system says I should trade or whatever. I'm trading because I'm looking at the chart and thinking, you know what? A lot of people must have bought this stock in here, and a lot of people are going to look to get out of break even. It's human nature. And that's why technical analysis works. Okay. It you know, probably works so well because sometimes it don't. Because when it doesn't work, people are like, ah, oh, that's technicals don't work. I'm going to go off and do shooting from the hip or do what I normally do. 
But you can see that a lot of people bought it in here. So if it does begin to rally up, it's going to have a hard time getting through that area. So the pattern I'm looking at is it's not really a bow tie, but you can see that the moving averages have crossed over since their major high. Okay. And it's a first thrust, and it's also a base breakdown. And to those with a pretty good eye, you'll probably notice that it's what? An inverted cup and handle or a rounded top going back to classical technical analysis. So that's why I thought that market had topped. And then USO. Now, USO is oil, and it's a commodity. And I'm not a huge fan of trading efficient markets. I was a commodity trading advisor for 14 or 15 years. Uh, so I know a little bit about commodities. But when it comes to like an ETF on a commodity, I'm not a huge fan of trading them. But every now and then, you can get an inefficient move in an efficient market. Uh Efficient market is a market that's well traded. You have a lot of participants in it. They tend to cancel each other out. So in the oil market, you've got uh, you got the refiners who have to buy the oil, and they may be selling futures contracts or buying futures. Well, I guess it might be buying futures contracts ahead, and then you got the hedgers, which might be doing some sort of hedging. People who consume the oil, a big consumer of oil. So you got all these players. Plus, you got us in there pumping our gas and. And there's so many people playing the market that they tend to cancel each other out. It tends to make for a choppy market. But trends still can and do develop, and inefficient moves can and will develop. But you have to pick your spots carefully. So instead of being a generic trend follower, what I want to do is I want to wait until the market gets to the fringe. And in this case, it makes a nice double bottom out of a long downtrend. And then I begin to see that trend turning. And it's kind of a kind of a little bit of a cup and handle once again, almost a bow tie in here. And I think it, it became a bow tie before it actually triggered. So that's what I saw in USO, which we hit the first profit target yesterday on that one. In fact, we'll take a look at the portfolio in just a second. And then finally, SOL. Well, guess what? SOL, we are SOL. <laughs> Laugh to keep from crying. You know, sometimes sometimes I'll laugh at these presentations and we have some losses and people be like, Dave, that does not make up for my loss. I'm like, I know it doesn't make up from your loss for your loss. It's it's just uh sometimes you gotta laugh to keep from crying. Uh if I saw this pattern tomorrow, I would take it. Okay. And that's the litmus test. Anytime you get stopped out of a trade, tell yourself, self, let's go back and look at that chart. Now, luckily. And I've said this a few times, so bear with me. But whenever I go back and do some uh, forensics and, and looking at uh, results and stuff, and just to see what worked and what didn't and, and, and kind of adding things up, every now and then I'll go in and I'll see a trade and I'll go, what the hell was I thinking? And the good news is that doesn't happen very often anymore. Because now I look at everything and I say, okay, before I'm going to put my hard-earned capital in the harm's way, do I really think that I could increase my capital by taking this trade? And then I take the can't stand it test, okay? If I didn't take it, would I feel like, oh, it, just, it would kill me not to take the trade? So if you feel that way, you take it. If you feel kind of like, eh. So I guess it's kind of the eh test. If you feel that eh, then don't take the trade. But if you look at it and you think that's truly an opportunity. Now, as uh, somebody wrote in Market Wizards, I forget who, sometimes there's intuition and sometimes there's into wishing, okay? So if you're into wishing a position, that's a different thing. But if your intuition and your gut and you just get excited when you look at a trade, then you need to take the trade. This chart looked good to me, and there's nothing wrong with this chart. There's nothing I could pick apart, okay? Uh, going into it, I knew there was a little overhead back here. If I can get my pen to work. Where'd it go? Oh, here it is. I knew there was a little overhead back here, but I figured this stock looks like it bottomed out and had the potential to take off. Uh, energy stocks were looking pretty good at this point. Um, alternative energy, which is this is a solar stock, so I thought it had a chance to double or triple from here, but it didn't. So what? All right. So here is the current um, portfolio. Uh, Craig says sound is off. Mm, nope. I'm not. Uh, it's working here. Organizer's muted. 
Does everybody else have sound? Hello? Okay, yeah, everybody else has sound. So, Craig, uh, I know you can't hear. Craig! <laughs> so, uh, sometimes a, uh, you know, it's a long distance between me and you, Craig. I think Craig's up in Oregon. Uh, Craig's a client of mine. Um, sometimes a squirrel gets his nuts caught in the wires and it kind of messes things up. Um, anyway, <laughs> but I digress. So this is a current portfolio. Uh, the trill that was in here is uh, has been stopped out at a profit. And this SOL just uh, stopped out today, okay? Well, so what? Okay, this number's still pretty big, especially if you add in that last little profit that just stopped out. So what? Okay, it happens. And if I could always be this accurate, I would own the world pretty quick. So I'm pretty proud of that. Now, speaking of accurate, as I said yesterday at a webinar, I'm not so worried about being accurate, although it does kind of stroke me, go make me feel good. And like today, I'm like, hey, look at this, 10 out of 11, look at me, you know. It, it feels good. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I like uh, I like being accurate. I like being able to throw this portfolio up here and say, hey, look at this, 10 out of 11. That ain't bad, right? But I would much rather see a huge number and some of these second lows, maybe a number this big, 17 or 18 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, okay, 1,000 in the second loaf than to be accurate and say, hey, look at me. I'm 10 out of 11 accurate, okay? Well, 10 out of 11, if you only make a little bit of money, so what? What good is that to be accurate and only make a little? I want to make a lot, and I don't care how accurate I am. And that's hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around when it comes to, to trend following, okay? They have a hard time like, well, I, I got to be right. I got to be right. Well, no, you, you have to make money. You don't have to be right. You have to make money, okay? Hey, Dave, what's that last stock in there? Oh, you mean this one? G-R-E-K, that's the Greece ETF. And you're probably thinking, Greece? What the? Why in the world would I buy Greece? Well, that's what I call, we talked about this last couple of weeks, the Steve Winwood trade. And Steve Winwood once sang, when you see a chance, you take it. All right. Now, Greece is all crazy over there. It's all Greece is going to come unglued. Greece is going to fall off the face of the earth. Greece, 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 Greece. Well, what are the charts saying? Well, for a while, the naysayers were right. Look at that. Look at that. Uh, what's a good word of calling a coprolite? Isn't it coprolite like dinosaur dung or something? <laughs> so. Greece just looked like heck. But what's happened now? It's made a low. It's made another low. Made another low. Not a big fan of three drives, so a low. Um, I think the pattern might have some merit, but it does look like three drives to a low. The other thing I'm seeing, though, is that these lows are fairly close together. If you kind of squint your eyes, it kind of looks more like a triple bottom, so I'll buy that for a dollar for $12 and it's also depends on where, how you want to draw it you can draw it over here or you can draw it a little further back still has a, that cup pattern that's a good good little pattern to look for and then once you have these classical technical analysis patterns these classical technical chart patterns you don't just run out and buy the stock or the market although I tried doing that when I first got started and it was very expensive to do that every now and then you hit it right and boy oh those double bobs are great Double tops are fantastic for shorting. But then, or head and shoulders or whatever. But then I quickly learned that a lot of times it's not going to work. It's still a valid pattern, though. But you just need to wait for a trigger. And that is the secret sauce. So if you don't walk away with anything today, other than the money management stuff I preached in riding out your winners, know that if you find classical technical patterns, you need some sort of trigger before you get into them. And guess what? If they work, 
you've got that big pattern behind you, okay? So in this particular case, in Greece, two days ago, had a bow tie. Man, that's kind of hard. You got to close your eyes. You got to close your eyes. You got to hold your nose and just look at the chart, okay? I wish I had a camera on me. I could I could make a, 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 a impact in the presentation. Sometimes I do things in the presentations, like with my hands and all, I'm thinking you could see me. But let's, if you covered this up up here, okay? And you saw this chart and you liked it, then you should take it. It doesn't matter what it is, okay? Even if it is Greece and Greece has problems. Maybe this is a good thing. You know, if everything was going along swimmingly in Greece, then I would be less excited about this trade. But everything's not going along swimmingly. So if this thing works, it could work big. Knock on wood, so far so good. Now, stick back, come, come back often. I like to use live examples in these presentations. So next week, and next month, and next year, and hopefully five years from now, if you'll have me, and if I don't get hit by a beer truck, we can come back and look at these examples and see how they played out. All right, any questions or anything so far today? Again, it looks like I just trade transitions, but that's what the market is uh offering up but if you go back a little if you go back and look at those pullbacks those are just generic pullbacks in there and that goes way back to last september and that's when we were getting a lot of good uh, setups in the ipo market all right a couple of announcements and we'll jump into the um charts if you go to my website and you hit products it'll bring you to the store or you can go directly there by hitting the store and that keeps all this free stuff free uh again if you want the uh, promo code for to get started in service, 40 bucks, and you'll have instant access, and you'll have instant access to all the recent archives. Uh, the older archives are out uh, free for anyone to access, and I would encourage you to go in there and download those and look at them as you have time. The, uh, the newer ones are behind the firewall, and it's very important to go in and look at those newer ones if you want to get in step with the current market conditions. So you're gonna go in and see uh, everything that I just explained to you, plus a lot more about my thinking in the market, seeing the energy bottom develop, seeing the Chinese uh, bottom develop in the second tier stocks, seeing Greece develop as I just showed you, and you'll get to get a feel for those things in real time, and then you'll get in sync with the market. Like the guy said, I have this uncanny ability to, to find these, uh, sector rotation things. Well, I just think I've just been doing this for a while and I looked at over 10 million charts. So I'm not, I don't have any special superpowers. I just look at a lot of charts and I put my ego aside and I don't try to pick a bottom, don't try to pick a top. When I see these things unfold, when I see a chance, I take it and that's all I do. And once you get in sync with my thinking, then you'll start seeing these emerging trends develop, whether I'm pointing them out or whether you can see them on their own, but very important. So 40 off, all lowercase, and then, again, just go to products, daily trading service, or this direct link. Somebody just signed up. I just got a ding. Thank you. Or as, uh, what's your name, Odia says? Thank you. <laughs> uh, just a couple more things, and we'll hop into the charts. Uh, unlimited lifetime support goes with all courses. So you take the stock course, stock selection course, you got a question about stock selection, five years from now, give me a call. I'll help you out, okay? YouTube channel, once again, youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry. We turned 100K this week, so I'm pretty excited about that. And now we're going to go for a million views. The good thing is a lot of those views, I have to I have to put the minutes up too because a lot of those views are uh, – or people that are watching the week of charts for a year. I mean, for a, an hour and a half. Yeah, I did have the camera back on. Gosh, Matt, you're showing my age. Matt says I should have the camera back on like back in the trading markets days. Eh, I might experiment with that. Who knows? I do uh, I do have the camera on on uh, those Monday uh, webinars that I do where I'm host for uh, timing research. I got a... Take a shower, throw a coat on, <laughs> shave, and look presentable. <laughs> okay, let's hop into the charts. Um, I want to point out some uh, conditions 
some developing conditions in the overall market. But while I'm doing that, if you guys want to start asking questions about individual stocks, start uh, punching them in. Uh, for those who, of you who do the show, if you want to know about 10 stocks, that's fine. Just punch them in one at a time so I can delete each one after I, uh, I talk about them. All right, I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time talking about the markets because there's only there's only a few things that I really want to point out to you, and then we'll jump to the charts. But they're very important things that are occurring right now in the market. So the S&P just hit all-time highs recently, and then it sold off from those highs, and now we're back in the middle of the stupid range. It's kind of funny. I, I think I don't know if I said this last week or not, but someone sent me like a condolence email, and he's like, "Oh, Dave." Uh, I hope you're okay because I know the market hasn't done anything since Thanksgiving. I'm like, <laughs> we're doing fine, you know. <laughs> Don't worry about us. Now I can't guarantee it always will be this good when the market goes straight sideways like that. If you just show me this chart today, it's say I could go back and do whatever I want for the last three months. I'd say, why well, I wouldn't do anything, okay? But we saw those opportunities present themselves, and then the overall market just didn't pan out. Now, if we start seeing fewer opportunities, that combined with the fact that this market is going sideways, which it, we might start seeing fewer opportunities lately or, or soon, I should say, then we might end up sitting on our hands. And that's okay. I got asked that a lot yesterday when I mentioned the trading service. Uh, you know, How many setups do you do every day? It's like, well, it depends on the conditions. There will be times when I won't do anything. And by the way, somebody last September quit the service. And I'm like, why'd you quit? It seems like there's no, there's no a lot of opportunities out there. So I'm just saying, let's just wait a little bit. So why'd you quit? Not enough action. It's like, well, why are you trading? It's like, are you trading to make money or are you trade for action? Okay. Two different things. And if you want to action, save your money, just go to Vegas. It's a lot cheaper than trading. Trust me. So that same, the point I'm trying to make there is he quit because there was no action. And then what happened? We had one of the greatest runs in probably a couple of years over those last few months. He gave up because it wasn't any action. Well, that's trend, you know, we don't print money every day. It's like you gotta wait for your pitch. You don't swing at everything, wait for your pitch. And then when you see the opportunities present, itself, present themselves, you take them. Peter Moffy, a good friend of mine, ex hedge fund manager, he's not working for, uh, geez, it escapes me at the moment. I, could, I can't think of, what firm he's with now, but he's an ex hedge fund manager. He's worked with some of the big hedge funds, uh, people, famous people you, you've probably heard of. Uh, but anyway, I was on a project with him a while back and he said, and I, and, and I know I told the story a thousand times, but it's just such a wonderful story. I said, Peter, I might not be your guy. He goes, why not? He goes, yeah. So, well, you guys are looking for trades and, uh, if I don't have a trade, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make something up. I said, I'm only going to give you trades when I see something set up. And then the way the pay structure was, was, was set up, I actually only got paid if I submitted trades. I didn't get paid for being on the staff. I got paid to submit trades. So I was a little concerned at one, about not getting paid and being on a project. And number two, not being the guy for the project because they're looking for trades. And he goes, no, Dave. You're exactly what we're looking for. He said, don't invent trades. And that was a beautiful thing. And so I went into this project and I waited until, like, I think it was uh, Jimmy Rogers said in, in Market Wizards. I waited until I saw money sitting in the corner and I walked over and picked it up. And by that, I mean, I waited until I found some setups that I just absolutely love that can't stand a test thing. And I started putting them in the project or submitting them to the project and one of the members if i tell you who he was you'd think i was just name dropping but one of the one of the members of the project when we finally met in purpose he's like uh he's like holy moly you were on fire doing that project and the reason i was on fire was because i sat and i sat and i sat and i sat and i waited until the opportunities present themselves most people weren't that patient most people as soon as the market chops a little bit they're off the chase rainbows but if you could sit and be patient and wait, wait for those trends to develop, some wonderful things will happen for you. Anyways, I digress. Did I say anyways? Anyway, I digressed a little bit here. NASDAQ's kind of been on a bit of a slide, a little bit of a bounce today. It's good to see this market's not going to make a route lower. 
It's good to see it bouncing. It's good to see these ranges holding in here. Okay, well, that's looking for the good, the bad, or the silver lining. But so far, kind of hanging in there. Certainly nothing to get excited about at this juncture. The Rusty has had me, um, I guess let me rephrase that. I've been most concerned about the Rusty, and I'll show you why. As of right now, we have an official bow tie down, okay? And that's a bow tie down of all-time highs. Now, the only good thing I could say about the Rusty is that it does have a lot of support right here, okay? Oh, got another order. Thank you. Uh, so, so far, so good as far as that support holding, but this does concern me. When you get a bow tie off of all-time highs or all-time lows, kind of like the Greek, the Sid, and those other stocks that I showed you earlier, it pays to pay attention. Not every bottom, or just let me rephrase that, not every bow tie off of major bottoms will become the mother of all bottoms, but every bottom will have a bow tie or some other emerging trend pattern like a first thrust. So it pays to pay attention. So we really need to pay attention to what's going on here with the Rusty. And uh, as someone pointed out in the, the webcast that I did on, on Monday, the, the show that I host, that you could never have a bull market unless the Rusty participates. So I thought that was kind of a, an interesting thing to say. So let's keep an eye on this Rusty. That's the Russell 2000, for those of you who don't know me, IWM. Now, I do want to show you what's happening in bonds. And again, this is where your transitional patterns come in. You had a first thrust down way back here, and then it sold off. It, it, it retraced up. But notice that that combined with the kind of a, I guess it kind of forced the bow tie to form here. That says that this is your high. And that high, or top, I should say, stays in place until it gets taken out, okay? Now, I'm not going all wave counting and crazy on you, anything like that. But if you get an emerging trend pattern and that high holds or if you're coming off of lows and that low holds, as long as that high or low holds, that market has topped. And now we're breaking down in here. Um, I think it was gold a few years ago or let me see what it was. It wasn't a beautiful pattern. I meant to punch in, punch in gold, but look, I, I fat figured it. Look, here you go. Here's a weekly example of a bow tie off of major, major highs. It just by accident, I punched this one in CLD. I meant to punch in GLD. Y'all probably thinking, yeah, right, Dave. But no, look how beautiful that is. You had a bow tie off of major highs, and the stock went from 20 something dollars a share down to $6 a share. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, how great is that? Let's take a look at GLD and see if that's what it was. Yeah, it was GLD. So if you look at the top at gold, you did have a bow tie here, but the main thing I wanted to show you here was that that's your all-time high. This was your sort of like a gatekeeper type of pattern. And notice that the high of that gatekeeper never got taken out. And not only did the high of the gatekeeper, that little, or if you want to just call it a retrace or a deep first thrust, not only did the high of the all-time high never get taken out, the high of that retrace rally never did get taken out. Now, it's been a choppy ride up until, I guess, about right here. But as you can see, it's worth paying attention to these technical patterns, okay, because they can pay off, and you can't catch major tops and major bottoms with them, okay? So the point is that if this holds – it would get to break down in here, then that would not be a good thing. Now, same thing with TLT, getting back to TLT. This was your top here, and this is going to be your top for now. Bonds down, rates up. Rates up, what happens is put a little pressure on the stock market. It's going to give the stock market a little bit of competition. And if things start getting iffy in the stock market, it becomes kind of like this vicious cycle. Well, I could lose money with stocks going down, or I can put some money into bonds or, or some interest-bearing certificate. And make some money so keep an eye on that now also keep an eye also remember that intermarket technical relationships only matter when they matter when it does it does okay now the other thing is you want to pay attention in the delta of rate change or the delta in prices of bonds 
delta is a fancy way of saying change, okay? The absolute rates are irrelevant. So if we go from a half a percent or wherever we are now to uh, three quarters of a percent or wherever we are now, whatever, that's that's no big deal. But when that jump happens over a short period of time, it wakes up, it, it raises a lot of eyebrows and it, it, it gets a lot of attention. So a lot of times you could end up with a, with a, I don't want to use the word panic, but a bit of a sell first, ask questions later. But always remember when you're doing intermarket technical analysis, it only matters when it matters. There's long lead and lag cycles. And I preach that almost every week. So do pay attention to what's going on, but don't try to trade them on a one-for-one -one basis. Speaking of the tops, stick a fork in the dollar. Now, what we have here, this was kind of strange the way the bow tie developed, but it's kind of cool. And again, there's your bow tie. There's your top. As long as this bow tie is in place, this is going to be the top in your dollar. If you want to catch a longer term trend, you put a stop up here and just be short the dollar. Okay. Now, what happens when the dollar goes down? Well, commodities, which are dollar denominated, are going to go up in price. Okay. Because it's going to take more dollars to buy the commodity. So if a dollar goes to 50 cents, then oil is going to cost twice as much. Now, it's not always a direct relationship. There can be long lead and lag cycles. Your mileage may vary. If you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast. And all those other disclaimers. I stole that one from Tom McClellan. FYI. <laughs> he had it at a presentation a while back. Now, let's take a look at some of these sectors in here. Energies, a little bit of a, a retrace in here or a sell-off. They do have a little bit of a, a double top knockout look to them, or at least in the spirit of the pattern. So we're going to keep an eye on this. We're going to use our stops uh, just in case. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at the USO. Oops. Boy, I got fat fingers today. I guess I got fat fingers every day. You see USO selling off fairly hard here. And see, this is why we take partial profits, just in case that's all we get out of the trade from, I think it was here to here. You know, eh, better than a poke in the eye. If it stops out. So what? Okay. To me, it still looks like a major bottom, and to me, it just looks like a little bit of a correction, and that's what stops it for. But just in case, metals and mining corrected pretty seriously today. But I got stops in place, so we'll let the stops take us out. If we get stopped out, so what? Okay. We'll say so long and thanks for all the fish. Some areas like steel and iron have been doing really well in here. There's your bow tie kind of correcting back down. It's a bit of a bummer, but let's see what it stops. Take because we might want to pull in our horns a little bit and not take any new positions here until we see some renewed strength. There's copper, you can see it's worked its way higher, pull it back a little bit. The main thing that I've been watching that has me pretty concerned is if you take a look at areas like biotech, there's that little ominous bow tie off of what all time highs. Okay, notice you had a retrace back up, stalled out, and now you got a bow tie. Pay attention to bow ties off all-time highs, or major highs at least. If you don't walk away with anything today, pay attention to that. Health services, oof, that looks ugly, okay? That's a scary-looking chart. Get a little bit of a bow tie here. Now, these areas are still at fairly high levels. Maybe a few big updates would negate everything. We'd have nothing to worry about. But what's concerning is these Momo areas are getting hit in here, these prior momentum areas. And if some of these areas that have been working or in more recent times, like all the ones I just showed you in the portfolio, if they start getting hit too, then it's going to be kind of a, a double whammy on the market. How many times do I have to tell you I do a webinar every single Thursday? All right, let's take a look at... Retail. Retail's another one of these areas. Looks pretty toppy to me, okay? If you're long, but, oh, Dave, I'm long these areas. I should just run out and bail out? No. Honor your stops, okay? Maybe the longer-term trend will continue to be your friend. But before you go out and buy any new positions, you want to think twice, okay? Semiconductors, same sort of action. Not quite as bad as the rest of these sectors, but getting kind of sideways in here. So far, just kind of sitting on the bottom of their range. So I think the bottom line is be a little cautious in here. Let's just take a look at China real quick. 
China's having its first correction in a while. But let's just for fun, let's take a look at a weekly chart. Okay, not much to gleam there. But so what? It's had a pretty good run. Okay. Now let's take a look. Uh, all right, let's take a look at these questions. TBT drawing, uh, TBT following your bond dropping theme. Yeah, Richard. The only problem with that is that it's an inverse ETF, and they're hard to play. Well, they're easy to play, but the problem is, unless bonds really implode, it's going to have a horrible tracking error. Um, one day I'm going to start a hedge fund, and all I'm going to do is short inverse. ETFs. Think of it. Give me an inverse ETF like RWM, and all they pretty much do is go down. And I, my argument is that it's tracking error. And uh, Stephen Place, I think from, um, I can't think of his, his site. He's an options trader. He pointed out that no, it's not a tracking error. They're doing what they say. They're tracking a day over day change. And one day I'm going to do the math on that and publish it so it makes some sense. But if you take a adverse ETF, for instance, like the RWM, when you track the day-over-day -day change, you get a tracking error. They're doing what the port with the, see, it's a, he, we call it in semantics. So his point is that there's not a tracking error. They're doing what they say they do. Well, the, the end result is, okay, <laughs> the end result is this is what an adverse ETF looks like, most of them. They pretty much just mostly go down. And the, the simple answer is when you're tracking something on a day-to-day -day basis or you're trying to, to mimic day-to-day -day performance on an inverse basis, if something goes down 10%, then your, your ETF tracker should go up 10%, okay? But if something goes up 10%, depending on your – depending on how far down you are in the ETF, it's like that drawdown chart rears its ugly head, then a 10% move can require 11.1% move to get back to break even. So hopefully I didn't confuse you too much because my brain begins to hurt when I start to think about it. One day I'm going to sit down and, and do the math and all that, but uh, I've got other fish to fry at the time. So be careful with something like TBT. All right, you want to look at Russia? Russia's got a lot of overhead supply to deal with, um, but yeah, it's it's worked its way higher. Let's take a look at like a bow tie there or something. Uh, it did kind of bow tie back here. I mean, the bottom is in place. The problem is it's just going to have a lot of overhead supply to get through, so I don't see any reason to get too excited about Russia just yet. If you take a look at like Greece, okay, now that chart looks abysmal, but when you zoom in, it doesn't really have any overhead supply. It doesn't have a big, big wad of trading within a range. It's, it's just kind of steadily dropped for a long, long time. And now you got a bow tie. And look at that. It's banging out new highs in here. So far, so good on that. John, I like that one, but I think that one was on the Landry list, so I'm not going to show it. But, yeah, good uh, good eye on that one. Fantastic looking stock. It's an energy stock. Starts with S, ends in L. <laughs> How's that for a tease? UTHR. Yeah, this stock looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Uh, this one has been on my radar for a while. We're looking to um, – there's another short in a similar area, actually in, in the healthcare we're looking at right now. Uh, it's sold off, but the way it, it sort of just – it didn't trigger yet. It just kind of meandered over here. I think it's still in trouble. I think it's still worth a short, but if it goes another couple of days without really triggering in earnest, I think I would leave it alone, okay? Because it's sort of consolidating it here and not dropping like a stone. I'm a little bit more picky on the short side than the long side because I think stocks should, should when they have these emerging trend patterns, they should drop like a stone like right away. All right, Richard, you've been waiting patiently, so let's go to you. Hubs, H-U-B-S. H-U, H-U, Hubs. Okay. HubSpot, what do they do? Anybody know? Is that like racks? Well, it's a relatively new issue, and it's breaking out to all-time highs. So that's a good thing. 
But it has been a little choppy in here. So for me to get excited about this, it's going to have to keep breaking out. And then on the next pullback, absolutely. So that needs to go into your um, your list. In fact, this stock will go just the way I run my Landry 100. I'll even make a note just in case I forget. This stock will go into my Landry 100 at the end of the day because it's breaking out to all-time highs or 52-week highs on an expansion of range. So any stock that does that, I automatically put it into that portfolio. And then I kick out something that's not performing as well. Now, I'm not actually trading that portfolio, but it's a great thing to to do. I, well, I was going to show you, but I've got to update it. So um, It's a great thing to do. It's a great exercise because you see the – you see the money flowing into the market. You see the money flowing out of the market, okay? What I've been doing lately, I've been taking out biotech, out of biotech, out of biotech. And that little slice of the pie has become smaller and smaller and smaller. Let me see if I can show you a snapshot. Uh, of that. That might be an old one. But the more recent pie that I did with this was much um, was much bigger on the biotech and the drugs. Oops. Let's see if I can find it. Okay. It's hard to get the scaling right on the screen. See, this I think this is a more recent snapshot. And notice how big this this drug piece was, okay? And notice how big this health service piece was, okay? And the semi piece is pretty big too, but in more recent times this has shrunk up significantly. And if you could watch the ebb and flow of this shrinking and and expanding, you can kind of see where the money is flowing in the energy sector. Uh, increased in, in recent times, okay? And China right here has started to increase, getting bigger and bigger. And that's a pretty big percentage-wise when you think about it, it's only 100 stocks in here, and 3% were in China a few weeks ago, and that that's probably a lot bigger uh, right now. I haven't updated it um, in a couple of weeks. So you watch that ebb and flow to get a feel for where the money is flowing, and then that hubs, whatever that is, is going to go in there. Let's take a look at racks just for fun. Yeah, see, Rax is doing pretty good. I was looking at this one yesterday. Now, it's not set up, but it's hanging in there pretty well considering the market. So maybe the software, its services, might uh, might uh, withstand this little slide we're in. So pay attention to everything. Internet, social media. Okay, thank you. Is Hubs is internet, social media. All right, I'm going to look into that. Let's see. Well, that'll be fun. Let's see what that is. GIB is a short for Mr. James. GIB. James normally has a pretty good eye. Let's see what he's got. Ah, uh, it's not bad. The it's well, first of all, it's HV is a little low, and the volume is a little low to be shorting. Okay. So with such low volume and such low HV, if they come out with some big news, you can see a big jump in this stock. Uh, I would give you an okay. Because you got to thrust down, and this is okay as far as the stock is concerned. It looks good. But based on those two things, the low volatility and the low volume, I wouldn't short it. UTHR, yeah, that's going to be a short. Yeah, we just talked about that one. So somebody else just asked about that too. Good, good eye. Uh, TGB? TGB. Yeah, it looks fantastic. Um now it's a cheapy, okay? It's a uh, like 80 cents a share, but the volume. Oh, not my volume. No, the volume's kind of low too. All right, it's a it's a pig and a poke, but as a pattern in and of itself, you've got a nice little cup and handle bottom. You've got a bow tie. You got a pullback. So I'm gonna give you a high five. Yeah, it's cheap, okay? But a lot of these metals and mining stocks have gotten beaten up, and it's almost all time lows. So absolutely. Who gave me that one? Was that James? James, high five. That was you. Hill for Andre. 
Yeah, on a pullback. Okay, it's 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 begging on new highs, but yeah, on a pullback, sure, absolutely. And see, look, it seems like that software sector is doing okay in spite of the overall market. So that's the kind of thing you look at a thousand, two thousand, three thousand charts every day, and you'll see things like, oh, well, this sector's kind of hanging in there. Rest of them, not so much. V K T X V K T X. Uh, nothing there yet. Super, super thin on the volume. Let's check a few days in here. Yeah, a little thin. It's got some good volume days in here. But, you know, volume, and it's I don't, not enough time to get into it, but there's quite a few things you need to consider with an IPO because the volume can be a little tricky on those. And we talked a lot about that in the course, as you know. You, James, you, you were in the course. So go back and watch all those things that I talked about. Um, I, would, I wouldn't rush out. Let's see. Yeah, there's a pattern that's developing here, but I don't want to get into it because um, I don't want to give the pattern away just yet to everyone. It's in the course, though. But, yeah, it's it's a viable setup, but it's biotechnology, and it is low in volume, and the market's getting a little iffy. So all those things I warned about when I first sh sh showed some of these breakout uh, patterns, you need to take that into consideration. But, yeah, put it on your radar for sure. Uh, Shaq's looking pretty good. We're finally getting a shakeout in here. This is what I call a toddler. It's a fairly new IPO. And you had a breakout here. And first breakouts can be pretty good in IPOs. You had a nice run higher. And now you have a TKO. Absolutely. That looks fantastic. Who gave me that? Andre. Andre, high five. Andre's got a good eye. C-I-G-S. But a lot of uh, getting high fives today, huh? Fantastic. C-I-S-G. Um... Uh, Chanshur, is that a China stock? Okay, let's take a look at this. It's got some problems a long time ago. It's okay. Um, I'd like to see a few more. Eh, it's okay. I'd like to see a few more days of the breakout, but it's pretty good. I, I, I'm going to say yes. Uh, a little thin on the volume, okay? But it broke out of a nice base, okay? And you've got... A little pullback, just your first pullback after base breakout, and you have a nice long base in here. So I'm going to say yes to that one. I, I rarely say this many yeses. This is this is this is a this is great, and it's not like conditions are that great. L G I H L G I H. Ah, uh, well, there's you're saying it's a cup and handle, but there's too many days in this handle. I mean, this is weeks and weeks and weeks. It's also real estate. Eh, real estate. Eh. You know, what's going on in real estate right now? Well, what's going on with bonds? It also, here, look at this. Look at this big wad of overhead supply. I would stay away from this. Even though I, I hear you, it's it's made some patterns in here. It looks like it's trying to work its way higher. But take a look at bonds. Bonds down, rates up. That's going to really put the cap on real estate. So... I would avoid real estate like the plague, not just because rates are going up, though. It's, you got to look at everything, okay? But if you take a look at the REITs in here, which I did not do. Now, that's construction. Where's the REITs? Here we go. What's going on with the real estate REITs? I guess that's redundant. They're just REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. They break it down. They don't look good. So I would be – it would have to be a pretty uh, – what was that line in um, in Pulp Fiction when um, Jules said – was his name Jules? Said he didn't eat pork, you know, and said that would be a pretty charming pig. And I think he dropped some effing pig. <laughs> so uh, it would have to be a pretty good look at real estate stock at this juncture for me to step up and buy a REIT. Okay, so Richard, I'd hold off on that one, not to beat you up too much. But, hey, I mean, you know, if I came in here and said, oh, it looks beautiful, it looks beautiful, then you'd go off and lose money and you'd hate me. So, yeah, CMT on a pullback, maybe, but um, who said that, Andre? Andre, look at the volume on this, 40,000 shares on average. That's a pretty thin stock. But, you know, sometimes these thin stocks, as a private trader, could offer some tremendous opportunities, but just – Know the um, the beast you're dealing with. One day I might op I might uh I might do a service with uh, thinner stocks because people love to trade them, but it's it'd be a little bit more dangerous. The I think the returns would be phenomenal, but they would be 
they would be all over the place. It'd be a bumpy ride. And, and you know what? Maybe it would satisfy everybody's need to have um, to have um, action. You know, I'm going to have to say I like this one, even though it's in mortgage investment. How many stocks are in mortgage investment? Let's jump to the industry, jump to sub-industry. Oops. Change watch list. How do I do that? Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's a few stocks in here, but, you know, most of the stocks in here are dogs. But that one looks pretty good. You know, that might be that charming pig. And that might be a new pattern. I'll call it the charming pig. This one's thin. It doesn't matter. Yeah, most of the stocks in here look like dogs or pigs. <laughs> charming pig. Hmm. That might work. All right. Let's get back to your stock. And then let me tell you why I like it. Uh, obviously it's been going down forever. looks like it just wants to go down. That's all it does. Uh, yeah, it used to be 137. Now it's what in the thirties, you got a major bottom. Okay. Kind of a cup bottom. I can't really draw it well with this software. You had a bow tie back here and let's see if you got a setup coming in. Yeah, I think this is interesting. I'd like to see a little bit deeper pull back here, but sometimes you won't get a deeper pull, deep enough pull back. Uh, I wouldn't personally trade at this juncture based on today's action at all. It would actually have to, even yesterday's action, uh, this one did come up yesterday. I, I do remember the stock now. Uh, it needs a little bit more knockout for me to go after it, but bigger picture-wise, it looks like the mother of all bottoms. It's just the timing is a little tough because it didn't pull back enough. Kind of adorned if you do, adorned if you don't. All right, Richard. See you, buddy. NPD. NPD. Uh, a little bit on the thin side. It's Chinese. I've been looking at this one. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more knockout move. And then now you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You got nine days of the pullback. So getting a little long in the tooth of the pullback, but maybe if it could pull back a little bit more, it might be worth a shot. Okay. Any more? Well, we're at an impasse. I want to thank everybody for coming. Obviously, uh, I appreciate you taking time out of busy schedules to come listen to me. I have a blast doing these shows. As you can tell, it's a lot of fun. And then I'll take myself too seriously. At least I hope I don't. <laughs> All right, going once. Going twice. You're welcome, Heather. All right. Well, thank you guys so much again. Oh, last minute. We always get one in. <laughs> yep, V-I-S. Uh, no. Uh, it's beginning to break down. Uh, you can't short it. I mean, I guess if you had a broker, offshore broker that, that didn't care about the rules and stuff, um, it's too cheap. It's not even set up. It's rolling over, so avoid that. All right. Um, any more? CLME. CLME. Yeah, I like that one. Uh, well, I already said the symbol, didn't I? I was going to say that's one on my radar I, wasn't gonna, I didn't want to talk about, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, high five, James. Fantastic. Um, gas stocks seem to be uh, getting their ship together and uh, looking pretty good here. So I'm going to give you a high five on that one. That's fantastic. Okay. On your portfolio graph at Excel, what formula did you use? The one where I did the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, um, the pie? Oh, I don't know. I just I I dug around the internet till I found out how to do it. And you just punch in, I just punch in the the numbers here, and then all I do is I download them from TC. Um, I export them out from Telechart, and then I punch in the numbers. I add them all up and punch them in. I mean, maybe one day I could figure out a way to to automate it further, but it doesn't take that long to do it by hand once it's set up. You want the spreadsheet? I'll give it to you. You do want it? Oh, fantastic. No problem. It's yours, buddy. Okay. Anything else? All right. Again, thanks everybody for coming. And uh, anything unanswered, shoot me an email. And then uh, I'll see. Yeah. Okay. You got to shoot me an email if you want it because I uh, I, I don't, uh, the questions get deleted from this. Um, they go away after I, I hit 
Excellent. All right. Uh, again, any unanswered questions, shoot me an email, David, DaveLander.com. Everyone have a fantastic uh, weekend if we don't talk again. And then hopefully we'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.